uh, for uh, a more complete elaboration of my views, you are welcome to the uh, papers that I've left on that front desk, some of which are in English and others of which are in German. Um, and I, I think they probably will provide a useful clarification uh, of what is a, uh, going to be a relatively brief presentation of my ideas. Uh, my topic today is the relevance of secularism for understanding our political situation, which is the one that is now dominant in Canada, the United States, and much of the Western world. Underlying this investigation are two assumptions about what secularism is or is not. One, it is not clear that secularism in the contemporary West is an entirely post-Christian phenomenon. Although secularists are committed to removing traditional Christian icons and phraseology from public life, for example, substituting neuter Happy Holiday for Christmas or the Black Festival of Kwanzaa for the Christmas season, the secularist alternatives nonetheless incorporate into Christian residues. What my books describe as the politics of shame, that is, the public often state sponsored attachment and special stigma to one's nation or race for past discrimination is by no means a worldwide development. It is mostly limited to Northern European Protestant societies. In England, Germany, and Canada, the administrative and cultural elites impose the politics of outreach on the major populations. This goes on elsewhere, and I'm sure some of it will not be and say this also happens in France and is now beginning in Italy. But what I would argue is that it exists most dramatically and in its most widespread form in Northern European Protestant countries and in the United States and in Canada, uh, countries that were part of the British Commonwealth. And from these areas it spread into other non-Protestant societies. Um, an enthusiastic Protestant and political like Jim Carter may be overstating the appeal of his ideas, but in the forward to the Great Awakening, authored by another Christian and social left, Jim Wallace. He writes this book as helping us, quote, to cap the power of faith in order to inspire and encourage the secular social reforms espoused by all the world's great religions. The secular social reforms that Carter has in mind sprang from a specifically Western religious tradition. And the mindset that Marx and Wallace is recognized in the Protestant while Western Christians in their societies are typically punished for sexist and religious discrimination, uh, incoming Muslims and others are usually allowed to do what Christians are forbidden to do. There is a willingness on the part of English, German, Canadian authorities to be indulgent uh, about the treatment of women in other religions. And this has gone so far that there is talk of the highest level of government in some predominantly Protestant countries, particularly in Canada, of instituting and in England of institutionalizing Sharia social practices as the accepted legal framework for Muslim communities. The reason for the double standard, I would argue, is not that Christians, the religion has mutated to social guilt and acts of public confession, focusing on the supposedly overshadowing evil and prejudice. Uh, in the U.S., this kind of behavior has taken certain clear forms. While the plainly Christian festival of Christmas is giving way in universities and public administration to a generic holiday season, the birthday of the black civil rights advocate Martin Luther King on January 21st is now the only national holiday in the U.S. dedicated to a national hero. King's birthday has become invested with Christological association. Our national media and our politicians stress his martyr's death the hands of an assassin while leading a garbage worker strike in Memphis, Tennessee. And while it is considered in the New York Times a form of art worthy of public financing to depict Christ suspended in Europe, anyone who portrayed Martin Luther King with less than icon I iconic reverence, reminiscent of medieval depictions of Christ, would be ruined professionally and socially. Recently, U.S. News and World Report noted that for Americans between the ages of 18 and 25, eight, Martin Luther King is viewed, quote, as the most respected person in all of human history. Oprah Winfrey places fifth, well ahead of Jesus. <laughs> in his best selling uh, collection of political sermons, God's Politics, Jim Wallace rejoices, quote, my son Luke attends a school 
When the teachers made so much of Black History Month in February, Luke is now getting the same things in school that we teach them constantly at home. Books about Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. At the end of Black History Month, Luke announced to me and to my wife, I'm going to be just like Martin Luther King, except I will have a different name and a different skin. Uh, of course, nothing could have pleased us more, unquote. Not surprisingly, there was nothing in Wallace's book which was on top of the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction books, actually it should qualify as a book of fiction, that Luke has ever been exposed to the Bible, except possibly in the context of his father's advocacy of certain social programs. Nor can one say that Christianity's founder receives in God's politics the same degree of awe as the assassinated king. Jesus seems to move throughout this work like an Arab social worker, or like a blog on an anti-war anti website. Bush the King's birthday comes at the beginning of another key event in our new liturgical calendar, Black History Month, which is followed by another month-long showcase of what is presented as an epic struggle against prejudice, this one dedicated to women. Needless to say, Women's Month is not centered on motherhood, a condition that earlier revolutionary liturgical calendars, such as the ones in Jacobin, France, or Communist Russia, paid honor to. Instead, we are urged to praise such women as Betty Friedan and Susan B. Anthony, both feminists who prepared women for the gender revolution that our current public administration promotes. A sign on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, which uh, thankfully has been removed by now, and was put up by the National Organization of Women, explains that many women have to give their lives for the right to vote. Contrary to this false assertion, intended to build a postmodern church on the bones of female martyrs, no woman, as far as I know, ever gave her life to extend the right to vote to other women. The extension of the franchise was the work of men. Furthermore, the American South and in the Midwest enjoyed the support of nativist men, who favored extending the suffrage to their Anglo-Saxon spouses to offset the political influence of Latin and Slavic immigrants. We were also occasionally made to celebrate civic saints, who performed double duty, such as Harriet Tubman, a black woman who smuggled slaves from southern plantations mm -hmm. into northern states. Miss Tubman, by the way, is rated second place in the survey results in U.S. News World Report, which tells you something about public education in the United States. <coughs> Another Christian, post-Christian saint, who rates very high on this is Eleanor Roosevelt, who had the advantage of far-left political affiliations and was once an advocate of, in quotations, women's rights. Mrs. Roosevelt is someone who enjoys considerable attention throughout this month. But her hagiography ignores the fact that she tirelessly campaigned for a single family wage, one that would keep women out of the workplace and which would allow husbands to provide food and housing for the mothers of their children. The single family wage which feminists in the U.S. have attacked as a male sexist creation was the paramount goal of American feminists throughout the early 20th century. It was long seen by such champions of women's rights as Mrs. Roosevelt and the American Secretary of the Treasury under her husband's administration, Francis Perkins, as necessary for the protection of women who wish to be mothers and homemakers. Although I have no sense of apologists for the horrible crimes committed by the Nazi regime, a way of terror to claim members of my family, there is something noteworthy and not entirely pleasing about how Germans obsess over their unequal historical nastiness. This Teutonic fixation has taken two forms, frenetically extending Nazi-like behavior or omens of the Third Reich to the entire course of German history, and taking an ordinary delight in any threat to continue German national existence. Only Germans would organize large mass demonstrations to applaud the firebombing of German civilians in Hamburg and Dresden during the closing months of World War II. Furthermore, one could not imagine any other nation that would create anti-national movements in tens of thousands devoted to destroying the remnants of their already battered national identity. The proud observation by Germany's past foreign minister, Joshua Fischer, that Auschwitz is the founding myth of the German Republic is only the preliminary first step for German political officials and educators playing out their country's special burden. This collective self-basement which requires, among other things, that German historical studies always blame Germans for all international strife, even when both sides seem to have been responsible as in the case of the First World War or the Franco-Prussian War. 
is so pronounced that one has to be, uh, I think the word nun sighted rather than blind, because I thought I was giving this originally for a politically correct audience. <laughs> uh, not to notice this eccentricity. But here too, we are dealing with something that is culturally specific. Shintoist Japanese do not beat their breasts because Japanese soldiers committed murder and mayhem against the Chinese and other Southeastern Asians. Nor does the Eastern Orthodox Church exhort the Russian people to ask the world's forgiveness for Soviet Russian crimes. After all, it was the former Russian government that murdered even more people than the Nazis, as Yuri pointed out. Moreover, when the Poles were charged with having killed more than a million Germans and having expelled at least that number from those territories they occupied after World War II, their leaders simply explained the Germans had it coming. When the descendants of Polish Jews in America complained that Poles had actively cooperated with the Nazis to get rid of Poland's Jewish population, Polish historians insisted these charges were overblown. Indeed, Polish-American historian Mara Kodigiewicz, who works at the World Institute of Politics, produced a hefty monograph on Polish-Jewish relations in 1944-1947. Kodigiewicz, whose work has been translated and widely distributed in Poland, demonstrates the Polish Jewish leaders and treats was far more complicated than Poland's critics recognized. And this uh, goes on and on. Um, uh, the point being uh, that the Poles do not run around beating their breasts about uh, real or alleged crimes committed against other people. It seems to be uh, peculiar, as I would argue, to certain Western countries and most dramatically uh, to the German, the case of the Germans. But an equally suspect occurrence. The defacing of Jewish tombstones in Cologne in 1959, an act that has Stasi's German fingerprints all over it, and which came during a delicate crisis in East West relations, was not viewed with comparable doubt. German intellectuals, journalists, and educators used the occasion to condemn the German people for not having faced up to their past. This act of desecration unleashed a series of laws and demonstrations against fascism and neo fascism that went on for decades and whose effects as reflected in German public discourse, um, uh, are reflected in German public discourse and have resulted in a serious uh, attack, I would argue, on civil liberties in Germany. But here, too, a distinction must be drawn between German Protestants and German Catholics. The prolonged fits of guilt, masochistic confessions that go with the politics of shame are far more characteristic of German Protestants than their Catholic fellow citizens. Ever since the Evangelical Church in Germany issued its first declaration of guilt, what well, it really is, it shows uh, 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 in October 1945, its spokespersons have been taking responsibility on behalf of their people for every political misfortune which the German government was involved. These self condemnations now extend from Nazism to the First World War, from there to Bismarck, Frederick Gray, all the way back to Kung Luther's unkind references to Jews and his Tishrei, his, his table talk. And even before the Germans became a recognizable um, uh, a nation, it were the crusades that contemporary Germans are still gnashing their teeth over, and over the treatment of the Herreros in Namibia or West Africa, which now in some ways is even coming to overshadow, uh, at least for some leftist intellectuals, the Holocaust. These periodic blood and of course, these bloodbaths in the Middle Ages are linked exclusively on the West and more particularly on the Germans. Uh, since the 1990s, moreover, the self accusations of the German evangelical church uh, had ample enough to encompass the now widely mentioned problem of xenophobia, the lack of a welcoming attitude toward third world immigrants, German Protestants are told, is a sickness of the soul, and a very grave one, that the Bishop of Berlin. Berlin Brandenburg attributes the residual toxin of German nationalism. Presumably, his congregants would have to work harder not to notice the soaring crime rates in their cities. So, self incrimination is far less obvious among Catholic dignitaries, even in Germany. For example, Karl Carter Lehmann of Mainz has scolded uh, Islamic fundamentalists for their intolerance of Christians and their deplorable treatment of their wives and daughters. Unlike the evangelical bishop of Berlin, Wolfgang Hubel and his fellow Protestant church from the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who has been known to make such statements. Later, like other German and Austrian Catholic dignitaries, is opposed to bringing Sharia law to one time Christian countries. Another critical distinction may be called for before proceeding further.
further. Although American Catholics often favor Latin American immigration and typically vote for left of center political parties, much more typically, in fact, than American Protestants, their clergy are less inclined, I would argue, than mainline Protestants as well on political correctness. This is a point that Thomas C. Reeves has little trouble demonstrating in his book, Empty Church. And even more relevant, it is hard to find in Catholics the religious motivation for social guilt that is increasingly characteristic of Protestants. It might be said that while Catholics more frequently than Protestants support the left in the U.S., Canada, and England, they do not do so because they are religiously driven. They are embracing their positions because they believe themselves or their ancestors to have suffered under a Protestant majority. Equally important, they do not view themselves in most cases as applying religious principles, and certainly not Christian ones, to public life. It is not unusual to encounter young or even middle-aged Catholics who say that they personally believe that abortion is homicide. Still, these respondents don't want to force their views, or at least not these particular views, on anyone else. Such a stance is so late uh, with a contradiction, presumably such bearers of tolerance, would not have any trouble sticking down someone else's throat, the latest legal offenders doctrine, that one is forced to infer that those things that do not really matter to the speaker are precisely the ones to be tolerated as they subsidize. What is irrelevant in any case is a traditional religious conscience, which does not usually explain why Catholics are to be found on the cultural and multicultural left. But the Protestant case, I would argue, is different. Protestant teachings and habits have played a crucial role in creating, at least in the United States, uh, the politics of shame. Meditation on one's fallen state, attempts to distinguish the righteous from the sinful, public declarations of collective remorse as signs of one's election, are in the United States the traits of the traditional Protestant culture, and all of these traits can be found in our mainline churches. These are institutions whose leadership has been sliding for decades toward the multicultural left. And they vast literature now exists that underscore how far reaching the effects of these tendencies have been. The, uh, uh, a process similar to the one described in uh, the books that I, I cite here went on among Protestant leaders and spokesmen in the early and mid 20th century. Back then, it took the forms of bewailing imperialism and engaging in communist fellow travel. Thus, we had spectacles of such Protestant clergymen as Zula Johnson, Dean of Canterbury in the 1940s, and the Congregational's chaplain at J.O. William Sloan Coffin in the 1960s, and many, many Quaker clergy, well, the people associated with the Quaker Church, leadership capacities, who belonged to communist front organizations, uh, making jubilant pilgrimages to communist states, or extolling African socialist dictators. Now we find another version of Western self-protection uh, in forms that are at least partly motivated by religious impulse. For evidence of this new Protestant fashion, the readers refer to Jim Wallace's book, which provides a certain theological justification <coughs> for these secular social reforms. But Wallace and his clerical devotees and his readers reject the idea of pushing radical politics as a Christian public activity. They are more than willing to hail secularism as the fulfillment of Christian piety. Wallace extends an invitation to impoverished third world populations, quote, to enrich our geographical space. No longer do supposedly enlightened Protestants expiate their sins by visiting and praising left wing dictatorships across the globe. Instead, they try to rebuild their societies by welcoming the rest of the world. If the American working class recoils from this Christian imperative, Wallace explains the Great Awakening, the reason is that they are economically insecure. But this is not the fault of the illegal immigrants, but of the national economic policy, the morally flawed budgets, and the lack of living wages from huge corporations. Apparently, Wallace has never discovered that huge corporations and their defenders at the Wall Street Journal have been at the forefront of those demanding amnesty for illegal residents in the U.S. Cheap labor in the, in the case of the business easily trumps that phobia. Note the term one group is not an entirely accurate description of what the Protestant secular is wishing free the Western world from. His or her group also includes the once invisible saints who are now making their presence known through public contrition and outpourings of social guilt. The majority of Christian population that does not stand in the saintly company 
belong to an unredeemed xenophobic world. One deserve that and deserves to perish as the final age of global citizenship is imagined to be approaching. The solemn renunciation by the saints of public recognition of Christianity, a habit that is thought to make others feel comfortable, is viewed as a very modest step in the war against Western small-mindedness. No reciprocity is, of course, demanded from the other side, which enriches by merely standing on our soil. Let me point out that what I've sketched is the set of religious attitudes that I encounter daily in my workplace. Every day I meet the people I've been evoking as a professor at German Pietist College in Pennsylvania, which still bears, however distorted in fashion, the imprints of its founding. Not surprisingly, the Christian core of the college has given way to a center for global citizenship. And the pronouncements coming from our president celebrate diversity and internationalism, quote, as expressive of our school's traditional religious mission, unquote. When the remaining clergy on campus are asked whether the secularist mission really embodies their belief, my question never fails to occasion wonder. It seems foolish that I would even be asking. In a certain sense, I am witnessing the fulfillment of a prophecy found in a book that created a splash when I was in graduate school in the mid-1960s. Harvey Cox is the secular city. This widely read analysis of Protestant outreach, which was also a statement of the deepest conviction of the author, a Harvard professor of theology, viewed the secularization of his religion as a sign of his triumph. Cox's view is that secularists are on the right track when they try to wean Americans, quote, away from their healthy reliance on the God figure, unquote. In order to achieve the kind of social progress that the Bible only hints at, we must first become, in quotations, true human beings, and we must abandon the childish doctrines taught by organized religion over the centuries, unquote. Such opinions are not only widespread in today's theology departments, as profusion of critical literature and the testimony of divinity schools would reveal, they also point to a specifically Protestant path to secularism, which must be distinguished from other paths leading away from traditional religious belief. Although these paths lead to secularism and occasionally intertwine, they are nonetheless different from each other. Muslim religious skeptics are more likely to become Arab nationalists than they are to become advocates of massive immigration and cultural mixing. Uh, it is also inconceivable that third world secularists would expend energy apologizing to other nations and national minorities whom their people once heard are offended. As far as I can ascertain, there is no Buddhist or Hindu politics of guilt. And to the extent that such flora and fauna have taken root among Christians, it generally thrives best, although not exclusively, in secularizing Protestant societies. Let me close by calling attention to what I am not saying. I do not mean to suggest that Northern European Protestants and their North American counterparts have never acted badly in their history. Demonstrably, they have, as of all other groups to at least the same extent. Moreover, Western Protestant societies have expressed deep remorse over their misdeeds, including exaggerated and often invented ones. Uh, and unlike most of the rest of the world, they have tried to make amends for past wrongs. They have also made available to the rest of humanity the fruits of their economic productivity, having health standards, educational institutions, and aid to underdeveloped societies. But in addition to doing these things, they made a fetish out of beating up on their ancestors and viewing their civilization as more sinful than the rest of the human race. And this thing has become more noticeable the farther one moves historically from what is being implored. The self-incrimination is always expanding in content. And it now includes even such normal human practices as drawing gender distinctions or preferring heterosexual or homosexual family units. Finally, I am not condemning the fathers of the Protestant Reformation or traditional Protestant theology for this derailment. I, uh, I have focused on Luther, seemingly Cranmer, and Calvin had nothing to do with what others did to their ideas hundreds of years later for reasons that no one in the 16th or 17th century could have possibly foreseen. What we are dealing with is a twisting of what my friend, Protestant theologian, Brent Havers, calls the obligation of charity into something very different, and the appeal to a distinctly non metaphysical guilt in order to generate total commitment on the part of the believer to a faith substitute. 
What allows this development to occur are forces that did not exist until well into the modern era. Uh, for example, the identification of justice and charity, equality, the treatment of any sort of inequality as evidence of wickedness. Because of other stress on the equality of all believers, their heightened sense of individuality, and their tendency to brood on over sin as an existential condition, Protestants have been at special risk to succumb to certain modern political temptations. But the emphasis here should be placed on the word modern or contemporary, lest we anachronistically ascribe the weakness discussed in those in the distant past. My interest is in showing how old habits of thinking can be made to serve current ideologies. They should be distinguished from indulging in the now widespread vice of sitting in moral judgment over the past. Thank you. Another short 